This is the BearCast, presented by Bird Culture and Ford. Bird Culture and Ford has been in Waco since 1936. Ford is the number one selling truck in Texas, 43 years running. The BearCast is also presented by WellMed Medical Management and USMD Health System Dallas. Here's Craig Smoke and Grayson Grundhafer. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome into a brand new edition of the BearCast on Sikkim365.com, 365 Sports. And we come to you following a big-time win out in Lubbock, Texas for the Baylor Bears, 45-17 to Baylor over Texas Tech. I'm Craig Smoke, Sikkim365.com writer, 365 Sports host. Joined, as always, by Grayson Grunhafer, Director of Broadcasting, also team and recruiting reporter for Sikkim365. we got Jack and Garrett behind the scenes. And, Garrett, there was a lot of buildup to – excuse me, Grayson, there's a lot of buildup to this one. There's a lot of talk about just all the different angles in this one. Um, from on the field, off the field, and, of course, just the importance in terms of entering this final month of the season. And, I mean, we had guys pick the Bears. We had guys pick the Red Raiders. I think we all thought, ultimately, this would be a relatively probably close contest. I don't know anybody saw this coming. No, definitely not. I would also say, you know, it was pretty close in the fourth quarter, but it was one of those deceptively close games, right, where Baylor was just dominating. It felt like Baylor was up by you know, 20 points the whole game, and it just never really pushed to that level uh, until late in the fourth quarter when obviously the turnovers just started to pile up on the Red Raiders and the Baylor secondary stepped up. And so really impressive. I know we're going to dive really deep into this, but overall, in general, this was a huge win for Baylor as far as just establishing themselves or continuing to establish themselves as the premier uh, college football program in the state of Texas. And winning those games against those Texas schools is not something you can take for granted. And so this was a very big one, kind of cancel some of that momentum that Tech has built uh, early in this season. Um, and allow Baylor to start building some momentum of their own as we kind of get into the home stretch of November um, when the real teams come out and the real teams show themselves as Brian Kelly uh, talked about for LSU this past weekend. But, you know, I, I'm impressed with where Baylor's at right now, and I'm impressed with how they're continuing to grow and get better each week. Yeah, it wasn't always a blowout throughout, but at halftime you felt pretty good when they were up 17-3. to You knew it wasn't over. And then third quarter got a little dicey, but it got dicey and it was 14-7. to I mean, overall, because of some Baylor turnovers that uh, ended up, you know, preventing Tech from getting any closer, uh, from getting within to 14, and then blew them out in the fourth quarter. I mean, the entire frame, they blew them out. A 21-0 blow, get off the sticks uh, to cement a, you know, a very lopsided final score. Uh, But we're going to dive into just the moments of this game. Uh, I'm just going to go over kind of the scoring drives, and Grayson can fill in the the, the coloring wherever, you know, you so choose. Uh, Then we'll get into mailbag, some predictions, and uh, that'll do it for for this week's episode. Uh, But uh, we also have one recruiting note, a decommit we probably need to mention from last week as well, and Christian Brathwaite. So we'll get to that a little bit later on. Uh, But let's start off with the game here. First quarter was pretty quiet. These two teams basically felt each other out. Uh, You'd have had, you know, post Closing opening drives where uh, you end up, you know, seeing both teams uh, turn it over on downs as they both made it very clear from the get go, like they were gonna, you know, we knew these teams go for it on fourth down, so not surprising to see both of them go for it. Both of them uh, come up short and uh, end up uh, giving the ball back. Uh, eventually, then you just uh, downs, downs. And then each one got one more drive in that first quarter, and that was it. And Baylor's second drive, they're able to get down there and kick a field goal to get a 3 nothing lead. Um, and then Texas Tech turns around. It was a nice drive for Baylor, uh, but it ends up John Mayer's 48-yard field goal. Uh, that is worth mentioning because he doesn't hit those like all that often. Uh, so, yeah, 48-yard field goal. You'd rather have had uh, a touchdown, obviously, but uh, given kind of this the early portion of the game, just to get points, I felt like it was a big deal for Baylor. Yeah, that was a great kick. I mean, that was really, really cool to see, and honestly, watching it, he seemed cool, calm, and collected. So good for him, and good to kind of know that Baylor has their guy, right, at the kicker position. I will also mention there was a point on the first drive that I think is worth talking about. I know you tweeted about it. I know a lot of people are upset about it, including myself. Um, you don't want your quarterback to get hurt. You mm-hmm. don't want your quarterback to take <laughs> unnecessary hits. You don't want your quarterback to, you know, be done for the year. But on the flip side, you're on the road and in crazy environment and you need to get a first down, you have got to take contact. 
You have to. Um, sliding, the sliding rule is terrible. So it's where you start your slide. And so you're never going to get a favorable spot in that regard. And you got to know the situation. Um, and we're going to talk later uh, because Blake Shapin did a much better job of that later in the game. But on that fourth and two, he really needed to lunge forward and go get that first down. So just something to, to mention because it could have easily led to a Baylor scoring drive. Yeah, so uh, he comes up short. Baylor kicks a 48-yard field goal on their second drive. They take a 3 nothing lead. And then uh, to basically close out the first quarter, uh, Tech in the midst of a you know drive uh, on their seventh play, they get uh, – all the way down to the Baylor, you know, 32-yard line, uh, first and 15, and Baron Morton is picked off, uh, not the, you know, first or last time for Texas Tech by any means with interceptions, but Devin Lemire uh, gets the uh, big interception in the end zone, and it's Baylor football. They stop Tech from scoring any points, so they get the ball back, and they're starting the second quarter feeling pretty good about things, even though it's just three to nothing. I mean, that was... Like, they didn't allow the crowd to get super into it. They pick them off when, you know, they're trying to strike back. And uh, that's one frame down where, hey, it's only 3 nothing, but this was, you could already feel that they were affecting the atmosphere of the game at that point. Yeah, and Barron threw that into triple coverage because he felt pressure, which is something we're obviously going to get to. But um, I do want to mention Devin Lemire. I guess I'll do it right here. Uh, one of the best games I've seen him play. This year, he was really impactful, had two pass breakups to go along with that interception. A lot of guys had career days um, in the secondary, uh, but he was very impressive in this one, played really physical. Um, so good for him making that play, uh, going up and getting a jump ball and then returning it 21 yards. And you're exactly right. That was a, just kind of a sign of what was to come of Baron Morton feeling uncomfortable and Baron Morton making really bad decisions. Tech, uh, luckily for them, didn't have to worry about Baylor doing, you know, anything points-wise with it as uh, they would end up uh, getting stopped on an 11-play drive going forward on fourth down. Uh, Blake Shapin sacked uh, near midfield on fourth down and three, and uh, that brought that interception following drive to a close. So score remains 3 nothing as uh, Tech's able to get some pressure. Yeah, and quick mention here, Baylor's got to be able to run a QB sneak on third and one. Yeah. And instead, they run a running play to Richard Reese, which I understand it worked all game long. So I, I understand that. You lose two yards, now you're at fourth and three, whereas a QB sneak, at worst, you just have a fourth and one. And instead, you try to run something else, you end up fourth and three, and then you got to call pass play and you get sacked. So I know Blake's not a very good QB sneak quarterback at this point in his career, but I feel like you can get more creative with it or put Kyron in to get a yard or, or something along those lines. Like going from third and one to fourth and three is massive when at least it could be fourth and one or a first down with a sneak. So just a little thought there. Uh, Texas Tech goes three and out, so it doesn't end up mattering, you know, uh, as they just ping pong back and forth uh, as far as, you know, shaping getting stopped on fourth down. Uh, Baylor defense gets a quick stop. Texas Tech defense gets a stop uh, as Baylor uh, decides to punt after uh, Blake Shapin and, and Gavin Holmes connect but come up a little bit short on third down and eight. Tech gets the ball back and is able to drive down and kick a field goal uh, to tie the game up at 3-3 at that point. And then that's where the party started was after Tech got their first points because then here came the Bears, almost like ticked off that, you know, Tech had, had tied the score or whatever it was, whatever the motivation or whatever just clicked. It was pretty much, you know, not all the way off to the races, but pretty close to it as they were about to build a lead. Nine play, 75-yard drive. By the Bears ends with Richard Reese getting into the end zone for the first time, uh, but he would also get in a second time and a third time as he had a, a terrific night. Uh, but a, a one yard a one yard touchdown for Reese on second down and one, and the Bears go up ten to three. Yeah, and on that Tech scoring drive, just to mention, Isaac Power had one of the worst punts. Of, that I've seen from him. 17-yard punt. Tech, of course, you got the field goal there. But yeah, nice drive by Baylor uh, to respond. A lot of Richard Reese on that drive to score their first touchdown of the game. And just impressive. It was one of those, RVO is here. They've been using it to start this game. It's kind of been wearing on Tech. And then finally it broke through and they're able to get a touchdown. So uh, very nice to see that, obviously, from Richard Reese continuing to impose his will as a, the lead ball carrier for Baylor. 
Uh, Tech would be forced to punt uh, going uh, three and out as uh, Matt Jones and Braid Nutley, or Brady Braid Nutley, got in on the sack. Uh, and that was one of many as well in the night. Uh, just like interceptions, just like tackles for loss, just like Tech drives, it ended in no points. Uh, Braid Nutley with a big uh, tackle along with Matt Jones. So. Uh, tech forced to punt, and that's not something that they do all that often, but uh, that was, you know, part of the, the big play was not only, you know, getting the sack and all that, but you're they're not going for it on fourth down. You're not allowing them to just do that over and over again. Uh, Baylor responds, and they feel like they at least break it open somewhat early on, but it wouldn't last, but they're still able to go on a 10-play, 74-yard drive that did not last very long at all, just a minute and a half, uh, a little over a minute and a half. I uh, had to convert a, a convert a fourth and five on this drive, and uh, ultimately it's Richard Reese again on third down and two at the two-yard line, and he's back in the end zone for his second score, and all of a sudden it's 17-3, to three, and uh, they don't know what to do in Lubbock, Texas. Reportedly people are already leaving for the, you know, parking lot at halftime so so much for this big crowd and this blackout and Patrick Mahomes and all this stuff that you know was built up during the week uh by halftime there were people that had already checked out and uh you had to feel pretty good but there was a long way to go in this game uh this third quarter was going to be the the real test but uh had had to feel good I know I did when they were up 17 to 3 at halftime yeah I mean when they went up 10 3 at 151 I was like okay so if they go to half up 10 3 this is solid but it really felt like they were up by you know two or three scores the entire half and so for them to get this touchdown it made the score far more indicative of what we saw in the field um, and I think that was the biggest part of it I will say they got a little lucky on that pass interference call it was just second and ten so Baylor still could have scored a touchdown you know regardless um was a little unsure on uh on that one on in the corner of the end zone there but in general a great drive by the bears a couple completions gavin holmes again uh, like you said across the middle 23 yards a tough catch um that he made and he made a few really tough ones he's had a great year to be honest and some uh, excellent clock management by Dave Aranda, even though I know a lot of people were, like, pulling their hair, like, what's he doing? We're wasting time. They wasted, like, a good 40 seconds. We're not using timeouts, and yet it turned out that he timed it out pretty perfectly. I yeah. think it was just a matter of not wanting to give Tech, like, a minute and a half. So they they just played it as close as they could, and in the end it ended up working out really well because Tech wasn't able to close uh, as opponents have been doing regularly. That middle eight, actually really good this week for Baylor. It's kind of like, hey, if you don't, if you do all these things a certain way, like good things happen. And I think this game's a prime example of like, hey, if you play with an edge, hey, if you play the middle eight well, hey, if you get turnovers, hey, if you get sacks, like look what happens. You end up with a big win. So 17 to three at halftime. And uh, then third quarter starts big. Hey, big uh, opportunity for the home team. They get the ball first, they get fired up at halftime. Well, they also throw an interception, two plays into the drive. Baron Morton picked off again by Mark Milton this time around at the uh, Tech 36-yard line. Baylor would turn right around seven plays later, go 34 yards as a kind of just scrape away a bit there. And eventually, it's Blake Shapin to Hal Presley on one of the prettiest balls and uh, catches that you will ever see. A terrific throw from Shapin, a terrific catch from Hal Presley over the shoulder. Uh, just beautiful uh, combo there and this is when you start to feel feel like this game could really take off in a certain direction it wouldn't necessarily because tech would fight back a bit uh, but this was a big score for baylor to build their lead up to at that point 21 to 3 and uh, that 24. touch 24 to 3 and uh, that touchdown did matter because tech would score a couple as we'll get to in this quarter to, to bring it a lot closer so building that big lead up turned out to be very important but a terrific uh, job by Milton to get the ball back, and then uh, the Presley shape in combination that was good to see as well. Yeah, and Gabe Hall had the first of his three sacks all in the second half in that third quarter, um, right before the interception by Milton, and a great play by Mark too. I don't know if everyone got to see the footage of it, but Tech had a guy running deep, and then a guy running down the sideline. Uh, so a guy going deep in the slot. And so Mark was tracking with him. And then once he saw the outside receiver get open, saw he had safety help with the slot guy, Mark immediately reacted, got upfield, and created a, an interception. That was a fantastic play and a very vet-savvy play uh, by Mark Milton as well. And then, like you mentioned, the touchdown. 
perfect throw from Blake Shapin. And this is where I tweeted, you know, how Presley has really emerged in this game, which he did uh, in a game when they really needed him with no Monterey Baldwin there. He was very impressive and obviously a great throw by Shapin on that one. Tech was very hit or miss in the passing game. Baylor's defense did a really great job, but they did suddenly find some room in the running game. In the following drive, uh, Sir Roderick Thompson able to really pop some some yardage um, and get a long, extended drive going. Now, this wasn't going to be something that they could have repeated over and over again because they simply would have ran out of time probably, given that it was 24-3. to uh, But in terms of a response, this really seemed to settle Tech down because they just kind of willed their way down the field and kind of did what Baylor you know, was doing to them. Uh, but 15-play, 75-yard drive that took 335 off the clock. Uh, so a heavy dose of Sir Roderick Thompson, a little bit of Baron Morton, uh, including a, a scramble that he had, uh, getting away from pressure. And uh, eventually, you know, you saw Donovan Smith come in at one point uh, and throw an incompletion as the Tech quarterback usage was a little bit all over the place. I mean, quite frankly, they, they don't – they have a guy in Baron Morton, but they clearly have other guys they feel the need to play and to change things up. So Donovan Smith just randomly comes in and throws a ball. And had he hit on it, like it might have like flipped things in a major way, honestly. Yeah. But fortunately for Baylor, it, it was, was a it, good throw, too. It was. Yeah. It was a fine play. And it really, actually, it was a fine call. If it had worked, it might have really done some damage. But uh, fortunately... Uh, one able to complete the pass, and a few plays later, it was uh, Baron Morton uh, to, uh, what is it? Uh, Henry Teeter. Henry Teeter uh, for the uh, touchdown, 24-10 to 10 as the extra point is good. And then it was uh, five plays later, a Baylor fumble that made you go, after all this feel good, you know, even 24-10, to 10, you're like, okay, 14 points is not insurmountable at all. It's third quarter. You're still feeling good, but then they fumble the ball. Richard Reese, otherwise pretty much perfect on the night, uh, just lets it go. Tech recovers, and I did not panic here, but I was going, oh, man, this is this is exactly how you, you blow a 24-3 to lead on the road on a Saturday night. So uh, definitely one that you'd like to have back. Uh, but that set up Tech in, in really great position. Yeah, and it was a speed option play, and Shapin pitched it to him, and immediately his eyes went upfield instead yeah. of reacting to catch the football. So uh, tough play, and you're exactly right. This is one of those moments where you go, okay, is Baylor going to revert to the team they've been all year? Because if they had, it would have been, oh, you give up a touchdown here, and then you come out, you turn the ball over again, or you turn the ball over again, or you miss an extra point, or you give up a block kick. You know what I mean? It's just this snowball that had happened all year. Um, and so in this moment, you're like, uh-oh, uh, especially after Tech responded. But um, again, Baylor showed some maturity in this game. Yeah, they did. But, I mean, I understand Richard Reese, things like that happened. But how many times do guys need to see – the example of taking your eye off the ball for even a second. It never works. And the only time, and, and you know what? It probably works a lot and we just never harp on it. But like when you see it not work is when, you know, you see the replay and almost every time it's a guy just taking his eye off the football for yeah. a split second. Like you, you just can't do that. He did uh, one of his only mistakes on the night and not even really all that memorable in the long run, thankfully, because he, you know, was able to, to tack on some some more big plays and lead them to a victory. But, man, at the time, it just felt like, oh, no, here we go again. And sure enough, uh, rightfully so, Texas Tech turns it into a touchdown, nine plays, 40 yards. All of a sudden, it is 24-17 to after being up 24-3. to And, um, yeah, uh, it got a little bit dicey, uh, but a nice long drive. Baron Morton. Uh, on the scramble on fourth down and seven, and simply a play where Baylor's defense got spread out, and he saw no option and just ran up the middle, and they didn't have anybody there to, to get to well, him in time. And TJ's TJ's got to make. Guy, well, I mean, he's got to make him. He's got to make him slow down more than he did. I, I don't know that I necessarily need to say he has to make that tackle. Now he is a veteran, so you would like him to make that tackle. But he didn't even really slow him down. He had his whole body on him, both arms around him, and couldn't bring him down on such a key play. Um, but yeah, like you said, you know he's able to get in the end zone. But again, Baylor had a shot. Baylor had a shot to to turn them over and really put this game away early. They did, but um, did not unable to bring him down. So Baron Morton scores. It was a frustrating play. And uh, now you're getting into the fourth quarter, and it's uh, feeling a little bit dicey as the crowd that really wasn't much into this game for the first three quarters was suddenly alive because why not? They're within seven, and uh, that really would be the only stretch where they, they mattered, 
quite frankly. I mean, the Texas Tech crowd, in terms of being like a presence that could potentially affect the game. Yeah. Because Baylor pretty much just took them out of the game with long sort of uh, run, like just kind of taking their will away with the run, you know, moving the sticks with Richard Reese, um, hitting the big plays. Like they just never allowed the, the fans to find a groove, I guess, if you will. The closest they really came to it was this sequence of like yeah. a couple touchdowns. But outside of that, pretty much kept them – you know, uneven on the night. Yeah, you might have been able to get some excitement with the play coming later if it had gone the other way. But mm -hmm. uh, but you're right. Like, this stretch right here was where it felt like, I guess, their crowd was most involved. And everyone I talked to, their crowd was, like you said, pretty much non -existent. They weren't really existing. Yeah. Um, well, which is, frankly, very disappointing, I think, if you're a Tech fan. Won a big game, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, not. Big game, Patrick but Mahomes there, blackout. I was told it. Uh, that, I, now, to be fair... I, I don't think I ever I never said it was the biggest game that they had hosted. Like I think that got lost in translation with some tech fans. I was just harping on the fact that it was a big game that had some like ramifications and some meaning to it. And I got shouted down like we've hosted bigger games, and it's like okay, fine, it's not a big game, whatever. And um, you know I I don't know like it ultimately yeah it didn't feel like that big of a game on TV watching. So I don't know if that's part of the deal or. If it was, you know, it wouldn't have mattered either way, but it was not what it was cracked up to be, that's for sure. So, anyways, fourth quarter, uh, Baylor, all that momentum that Texas Tech had, uh, they'd have some other moments to potentially grab it, but uh, Baylor really, you know, just took it away and kind of put it in a sleeper hold for a little while. 11 plays, 75-yard, five-minute drive uh, to retake a two-score lead, and uh, this was a thing of beauty. A lot of Richard Reese, including him, rushing for yet another touchdown on first and one at the one, a one-yard score, of course, and John Mayers with the extra point, 31-17, a huge response for, for Baylor's offense and for, for them as a team as a whole. Yeah, no fourth downs. It was a very just easy drive, it mm -hmm. felt like, for the Bears, and a great answer, and this is where you're kind of like, okay, Baylor just continues to be in control of this game. They're good, right? I mean, that's the way it felt. It just felt like, okay, Tech's defense line is kind of done. They're gassed. Their yeah. defense as a whole gassed, and so this is what you get. And uh, they're about to take off here. Uh, Texas Tech gets the ball back. They're down 14. There's still time to go. It's still, you know, they're, they're a quick strike offense, even though they really weren't on this night. Uh, they really had to work hard for for what they were getting. And really, the most effective thing was Taj Brooks, like running the football, if you, if you really think about it, um, which was not expected, I think, them to be successful running the game. But you have to get something somewhere. Right. And, and he was really, I mean, his numbers are skewed because he had that fluke run before halftime yeah. that really made him look even better than he was. But he was picking up some yardage. Okay. Like he was yeah. he was moving the football better than than them as a whole, I think. Um and so he was heavy on uh this upcoming drive as you could tell they were probably trying to kind of settle things down a little bit. As soon as they put the ball in the air, Donovan Smith intercepted and this is why Donovan Smith is um you know kind of in and out as far as favor goes because he cannot protect the football. Otherwise, he's got a lot of things that you really love, but, man, he turns the ball over a lot. Intercepted. Al Walcott finally gets him one. He's been – probably had like five others this year that he should yeah. have had, but – Had one earlier in this game. Yeah, had one yeah. earlier in this game. Yep, you're right. And so he finally gets himself one. What better timing? Uh, interception, Baylor, and uh, they get the ball back. Uh, unable to do anything with it, but uh, anything before I get into the following tech yeah, drive. Yeah, this was one of those thank you, Zach Kitley, for deciding after you convert a fourth down to bring him in and or to keep him in and have him throw this pass. Too like, cute. Way too cute. Like, I know you want to run fast and you don't want Baylor to be able to sub, which was also an interesting thing to watch was Baylor was doing a lot of that slow <laughs> yeah. sub, which is smart. I mean, you have an ability to do that, but I, that was a just terrible decision. Also... I'm not going to put that one on Donovan Smith because you're asking a guy to come in cold and just make a play out of nowhere when Baron Morton's gotten all the first team reps all week. That just didn't make a lot of sense to me, and Baylor made him pay. Yes, yeah, so uh, just to kind of play spoiler here, this would be the first of what would happen twice more for Texas Tech in the fourth quarter alone. So if you're Joey McGuire... You could tell in the post game he was very frustrated because, man, what did I talk about all last week? I talked about the opportunity that this was. What most disappointed him? The missed opportunity that they had here. He knew it, all the buildup and everything, and and just a giant missed opportunity. But big, 
bugaboo in this game were the turnovers. They absolutely killed Texas Tech. So there was an interception. Baylor goes three and out, unable to do anything with it. But, hey, it's still up 31-17. Tech gets the ball back, drives a little bit. Another interception, the fourth on the night. This one from Baron Morton again. Intercepted in the end zone, Tevin Williams with, I mean, I don't even know if we've said his name this year, but an incredible play where he just ultimately wanted it more. And I think Tech's probably going to use this as like off-season fodder of like get stronger and get meaner and everything else and probably have this thing on a loop in the field house type of deal because Tevin Williams just took it away. Uh, interception in the end zone on what would have been a huge score for Texas Tech. Uh, and instead, he rips it away for his first career interception. I know his father was ecstatic on social media. Massive play for the young man from Oklahoma. And uh, just much needed. Ripped away a touchdown from Texas Tech and um, just kept things chugging along in Baylor's direction here. Yeah, and this has been building. He's clearly kind of taken over as one of the the top guys in the rotation at cornerback. That that really has been something he's been trending towards. So was very happy to see this. And I know Tech fans are upset about it, but if you really look at the play, no nah, man, this is straight up. This was fine. It, it was because in in my view of it and the way that I look at it is. Tevin Williams came down with the ball in his chest and the tech guy was just trying to put his hands on the football. Like that's not simultaneous possession in my eyes. And so I think this was just who wants it more. Yeah. Tevin took it from him. Tevin won it more. And Tevin made a great play and a play that basically sealed this game. I, I it absolutely it absolutely sealed this game. Yeah, I think I think anybody trying to argue that this should have been tech ball is is a Texas Tech fan. For sure. And, and I yeah. think even most tech fans are, are they're honest enough to say, like, hey, that's bang, bang. Like, that's one of those that you just kind of – that's a coin flip thing, and Tevin Williams made the made the better play in the end. Like, I, don't, I, I saw no problem at all. There wasn't any problem with that. That was the right call. Tevin Williams, incredible effort and great job. And, man, that's just – I mean, that's – I was talking about you put that on a loop in the tech field. I was put that on a loop in the Baylor field house and show them an example of effort and just yeah. wanting it more and how that can flip a game because this prevented tech from scoring – uh, so then eventually Baylor, uh, unable to do anything with it, they end up having to punt uh, after eight plays and able to run about four minutes off the clock. So there was at least that to this part of the equation. Uh, and then uh, <laughs> they give the ball back, and Tech basically says, like, here's the game um, because they decide at this point, let's go to Tyler Shuck, who hasn't played like at all this year, basically. He's been hurt almost the entire time. And Donovan Smith's been picked off. Baron Morton's been picked off. Like, let's just see what the other quarterback has. So their original starter, Tyler Shuck, comes in. And one play, interception Baylor, A.J. McCarty. And he not only picks it off, but he returns it for a pick freaking six. And yeah. so it is suddenly... 38 to 17 Baylor and this thing is over yeah and honestly okay not only are we gonna put Tyler Shuck out there we're gonna have him throw a far oh, hash that's, out that route. Call was awful yeah what in the I mean that ball and that ball floated it was so uh, there's people in this studio slow. right now that could have picked that off oh, I mean yeah. it was just hanging there and AJ broke on it and then of course AJ housed it and great for him great to see that he's had some ups and downs this year so I was very happy for him to have that moment and you're exactly Right, that was like, ooh, this could get this could get really ugly if it continues to snowball like this. So, uh, big pick six, and yeah, it was a very long throw to make, especially on the first play, cold armed. I, I don't know what they were thinking there. Uh, Tech gets turned over on downs as uh, Tyler Shucks unable to to get anything really going, um, and he gets sacked to end his drive by Gabe Hall, his following drive by Gabe Hall. Baylor three plays. Uh, yeah, three plays, 26 yards. Quaylen Jones, touchdown as he gets in on the action, 45-17. to 17, And then time would whittle away. Baylor wins. Big exclamation point for Quaylen Jones to, to get in on the action. And uh, when all was said and done and time finally went to all zeros, it was 45-17. to 17, And Baylor had dominated the fourth quarter with three interceptions uh, in the final frame. Five overall in the night. Uh, with six sacks on the night, eight tackles for loss. Um, Richard Reese, three touchdowns, around 150-ish yards. Uh, you know, Blake Shapin didn't have a big night statistically, but no turnovers. Uh, you had the one fumble from Reese. Uh, but outside of that, man, um, this was RVO. This was take five. This was 
Even, uh, you know, I didn't mention, but there was a big punt that pinned uh, Texas Tech yeah. down. You know, punting wasn't great all night long, but there were some key moments there in special teams as well. The field goal earlier in the game uh, from a good distance. So, yeah, this was a complimentary football at its finest. Yeah, and I love to see this for Quaylen. And, of course, there's sour grapes from Tech fans saying, oh, you're trying to run up the squad. I'm like, dude, it's mm-hmm. third and one, and they handed the ball off. What do you want Quaylen to do, fall at the goal line? Like, yes. That's not <laughs> happening. Come on, man. No no college football player is doing that on third and one. So great to see that for Quaylen. Quaylen played really well in my eyes as well. Um, it was only eight for 38 and a touchdown, but he also two for 18 receiving. He's actually shown some pretty good hands, which has been nice See, and obviously, he's their best pass blocker at running back as well. Uh, also mentioned Hal Presley. He was 4 for 58 in a touchdown. And Gavin Holmes, 5 receptions for 77 yards. So those were kind of your big play guys at the receiver position. And then quickly on defense, Gabe Hall stole the show with three sacks. But Garmin Randolph was very active, especially early. He had two sacks as well. I mentioned Devin Lemire playing great. Al Walcott had a breakout game in my eyes as he's... You know, he didn't have that cast anymore, so he's getting back to full health. Um, so, in general, just a, a great performance by the Bears. All right, I know we got a lot of mail back, so let's hit Oklahoma real quick. They've won a couple games in a row. Um, they have uh, beaten Kansas at home and then turned around and beat Iowa State on the road. Uh, really, I think special teams was – was the big deciding factor in their game last week and the running game, um, getting some good stuff from their two primary backs. Dylan Gabriel's back and healthy. Um, but, you know, I feel like this is this is definitely a team that you can go up there. If you play like you did in Lubbock, you can go up there and beat them. Now, can you replicate five interceptions and, you know, all that kind of stuff that came with it? I don't know, but um, definitely a, a game where, you know, if Baylor brings the edge, you feel good about what they could do. If they play like they have at other times this year, they dwell a little bit too much on a win. Yeah, they can certainly go up to Norman and, and find themselves on the opposite side of of the feeling the past couple of weeks. Uh, so, you know, uh, this ought to be a very interesting game. Uh, but your thoughts on, on Oklahoma? Yeah, I mean, if you look at Baylor specifically, um, they're going to be able to run the football on the Sooners. Oklahoma has the 114th ranked run defense in the country. They give up 190 yards per game. Uh, Through the air, they give up 248, which is 90th in the nation. So, obviously, there's some problems there. uh, They're just not very good defensively. I know they played well against Iowa State, but that's Iowa State. Uh, Baylor is not Iowa State. You know, Baylor's got a top 15 uh, offense in the nation, averaging 38.4 points per game. Iowa State has the worst offense in the Big 12. So I wouldn't take too much away from that game outside of the fact that it was coming off of a bye and maybe Oklahoma is growing up a little bit under Brent Venables. Um, But in general, I think what Baylor does well, Oklahoma does not stop well. Um, So I think this should be a game that Baylor plays really, really well. And I think the only way that Oklahoma wins this game is if they're able to somehow run the football against Baylor's strong front. And if Dylan Gabriel plays a very high level uh, game of football against the Baylor secondary. And if we see that Baylor secondary regress a little bit from this past week. Yeah, uh, Jeff Levy, a former yep. Baylor running backs coach, is the OC. Uh, they last saw him in the Sugar Bowl in January as uh, Baylor got a win over his then Ole Miss Rebels and, of course, knocked Matt Crowell out of the game early and then kind of sat on sat on that offense and uh, did relatively well. Uh, that, was a, that was a fun night for Baylor football and program history. So that was the last time they saw him. There's some other connections, like Jeff Grimes was on the LSU staff, I believe, or maybe it was the Auburn staff, I Auburn. think it was, with yeah. uh, Ted Roof, their defensive coordinator. Um, so it's, uh, it's a game where if you want to get into like those kinds of relationships and whatnot, you can. Uh, but... You know, what are you really looking at as far as as far as this matchup goes? Yeah, so I mean, Eric Gray is a fantastic running back for Oklahoma. They want to run the football, right? They want to establish their run game. I, I think, man, Bill Biedenbaugh is just, he's fantastic for them. And, and to keep him was huge because you've been able to see, yes, they've transitioned offensive coordinators. Yes, they've transitioned head coach. But here's the deal. They are still dominant on the offensive line, and they can still run the football. They still have a physical mindset up front. And I think that's where everything starts for them. So the issue is Baylor's very good up front, right? And so for the most part this year, Baylor's been able to to hold teams, um, you know, down from running the football. I think that's going to be more of a focus this week, whereas last week the focus was Texas Tech's passing game. 
Um, so there's going to be a little bit of a shift there, which again, that's going to give Dylan Gabriel more opportunities, I think, against Baylor secondary, which has had problems this year. Obviously, guys to keep an eye on Braden Willis, their H back, you know, tight end, the, the guy that they always have, right? They've had Dimitri Flowers, they had Jeremiah Hall, now they got Braden Willis. Uh, they also have very good receivers with Marvin Mims, Theo Weiss, Jaleel Farouk. Um, they're going to try to attack Baylor in that secondary and especially try to create explosive plays. So uh, very curious to see that dynamic there. And as I already mentioned, defensively, you know, there's really nothing about Oklahoma that's very scary on the defensive side. Yes, they have some good players, some highly rated recruits, but so far this year, it hasn't all come together for them. And at some point at this moment in the season, you kind of are who you are. Um, So I don't know that they're going to be able to exactly change that identity in one week, if that makes sense. All right. On the Oklahoma side. Yeah. No, no. I get you. I mean, they're like, this is a game to me. Baylor's just got to play their game, and yeah. I feel good about their chances, honestly. Like, it's not even so much about Dylan Gabriel or or anything, Eric Gray. or I mean, I, I respect those players and everything, and I watch a good amount of Oklahoma football, but they're still very much a team trying to find themselves. Yeah. Like, they, they aren't quite um, fully polished in any way as far as their identity and whatnot goes. So, um, yeah, uh, atmosphere ought to be interesting. Uh, this might be the la- – I mean – would this might be the last time they go up to Norman? Or I guess yeah, it, yeah, it I guess will it be. would be. Yeah. Yep, the last time they go to Norman. I hadn't really thought about that, but yeah. And I don't think that environment's going to be crazy because a lot of my Oklahoma friends, they just it's kind of like a whatever year for them. Yeah, my uh, my mom and sister were going to go visit my cousin up in Norman, and like they, my cousin, you know, they were sick or something. But I feel like it was more like it's just not a big deal. Right. Like the, the game weekend, I, I got that more sense than I did the, the Which sick is part. sad. It's year one yeah. with Brent Venables. This is a big game for them, a chance to, you know, keep whatever hope they have alive for a Big 12 championship. And, yeah, I just, I think the, I don't think this environment is going to be anything near what they've faced in, you know, Ames, Provo, and Lubbock uh, up to this point. That should all aid them, though, in yeah. going up there. I mean, because all you have to do is just, you know, as you saw in Morgantown, is just not play well, and whatever crowd's there will get into it. All you have to do is give them some hope, and, and Oklahoma's not going to come to this game hopeless. I mean, no. they might not have, like, a jam-packed, like, college game day crowd, but they're still going to have tens of thousands of folks who are there every single time out and who believe Oklahoma is better than every other team in the world, uh, always. And and so yeah, they're gonna they're gonna face some adversity. But I just think the the lessons learned last weekend in Provo, in Morgantown, in Ames, like just apply that same energy and that same focus, and just execute, man, and not worry about all the BS. And this team can go beat anybody. And and that's what I'm hoping that they've learned at this point. That, because if they can keep that lesson going this final month, then they can really make a whole lot of noise. But uh, you got to worry about this week because, as Dave Aranda referred to, and as we've seen, there's this wild roller coaster you can get on where, hey, you're the hot team this week, and then next week you are the dregs and right. at the bottom of the Big 12. So that's what you've got to avoid is this wild swing. Just you got to play sl- steady and easy, and I think they found a good formula the last couple weeks. Yeah, so a quick stat that I just wanted to bring up I, I think that's really important is um, Baylor is 4-0 this year when they run for over 170 yards, and they're averaging 47.75 points per game in those games. When they run for less than 170 yards, they're only averaging 29 points per game. So keep that in mind. I think that 200 number is the number I'm circling. I'll also say on the year, the good run offenses Oklahoma has faced, here are the numbers that have been put up against them. Kansas State, 275 yards on the ground. TCU, 361. Texas, 296. And Kansas, 165. So there's a good chance Baylor's going to have success in the run game. All right, we're going to get in a mailbag let's here. Let's do it. All right, uh, let's get into some questions. And uh, we got a bunch, so we'll kind of get through these as best we can, as quickly as we can. Uh, Baylor Dad 79, I noticed Dave Aranda didn't mention Tay McWilliams during the press conference. Is he done for the year? Uh, no, no word on him being done for the year. I know people are scratching their heads over the length of time it's taking him to come back from the concussion. Uh, suffer against BYU. I don't know what Tay's history was prior to that. It's entirely possible that he's had a history, and that's amplifying yeah. things. Um, I don't know that for sure. I'm just saying that there's a bunch of people like, man, it should not take this long. It can take this long. It is strange, though. It is worrisome, um, but not like massive red flags, although you know him missing another week is, is a bit of a concern. But 
He's not officially done for the year. No, no, he's not. So um, I just hope he gets back healthy, man. I, that's my main concern yeah. is that he's healthy as a human being. Not, Agreed. Not yeah. even getting on the field. I, basically, I'm not expecting anything massive from him the rest of the way. And if it does happen, great. If not, I just hope he's able to to live healthy, you know, going into next year. Right. Uh, this is a question I had as well on Saturday at one point when it was just Richard Reese all by himself running the football. And... You know, they obviously weren't trying to risk shaping too much in the run game. Um, Quaylen Jones did have, you know, some carries. Then he got hurt there for a second, and so it was really just Richard Reese by himself. Uh, so also, why can't we give a few runs to Jordan Jenkins if we're worried about burning out Richard Reese? As always, love the show. Keep up the great work. Well, thanks, Baylor Dad. But, yeah, what about Jordan Jenkins? Where are we there? Yeah, so the big thing with Quaylen is, yes, the carries aren't insane. Like, he's not getting a ton of carries. But go watch Baylor passing downs because he's having to handle a lion's share of the workload yeah. on passing downs as a blocker. Because I was trusting Ebner last year a lot. Right, or, and so they Abram, need him obviously. to do that. So he's taking hits in that regard, and that's also limiting his carries right um so they're giving Richard more of the the running down carries um for Jordan I think it's pretty clear that he maybe just isn't ready yet um or else you'd be giving him carries right and so uh, I know he was dealing with injuries at one point this year so maybe he's just not to the point where they trust him quite yet um but I'm hoping at some point we get to see him it just might not be this season because if they get squirrel back healthy I think that limits his opportunities even more Scotty B, the Baylor King, which position group in particular will step up the most defensively against Oklahoma's offense? Great question. So, will step up. So, I'm anticipating that they will play well, not necessarily who's the most important in this game. Um, So, I'm going to go with the defensive line. Uh, I think Baylor's defensive line maybe has turned a corner. Um, I think they're going to be great against the run because they pretty much have been all year. Um, But I think they're finally going to start getting a little bit more pressure on the quarterback like we saw this week. And Dylan Gabriel is kind of a a perfect matchup for them because he's somewhat mobile, but not mobile enough to where he's going to kill you. Um, He'll just more so run for first downs, and that's kind of like what Baron Morton was. Yeah, he can't hurt you, though, with his yeah. legs if you let him hurt you. I, the big thing would be a secondary. I saw Lorando Johnson's tweet after the game about, like, Baylor secondary yeah. what? And, yeah. hey, I agree, man. After five interceptions, you know, toot your own horn and all that. But everybody had a reason to be a little bit uh-uh about that secondary. And so it was good to see them turn it around. But you got to string it together to really get the, the real deal respect that you're that you're probably looking for. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, great step forward. And – this would be a, a nice time to keep that that going, obviously. Scotty B the, uh, also says, anyways, Baylor Nation send prayers to Ish Wainwright and his family because he lost his dad at 68 on Monday wow. morning. So uh, didn't see that until you just mentioned that, but that's obviously awful news. And so yeah. definitely prayers up to the Wainwright family. I'm definitely. very sorry for their loss. See, Watanay Bear going back to LSU, ran his defenses get significantly better as the season goes along. That shows good coaching, but it cost us a couple games earlier in the year. I know they're not trying to be bad at the start of the year, but can they find a balance so that games are not lost that would be won if they were played later in the season? Yeah, I mean, this didn't happen last year, though. You know, they didn't lose a bunch of early games a year ago. I mean, they went on the road to Oklahoma State, who was a dang good football team. That was their first loss. Like, that that wasn't a game that I was like, oh, you know, if they played them at the end of the year in Stillwater, they for sure would have won. I, I don't know. You know, I don't know that that's true. Um, they can't beat Oklahoma State outside of a neutral site game. They well, haven't yeah, beaten them yeah. under a rand outside of Arlington. Yeah, and then TCU, I, I mean, that was late in the year. So Can't I don't know beat if, them, period. Right. So I don't know if this is really a trend. Now, if you want to say this year, what happened? Well, I mean, I would say it was more that their offense took time to to get to the point where they've where they are now. Um, I don't think the defense cost them the game against BYU, nor do I think the defense really cost them the game against Oklahoma State either. Um they they maybe did against West Virginia some, but your quarterback got mm-hmm. hurt. Like you can't you you can't predict that. So I wouldn't read too much into this. I, I know that you you may be trying to, but I, I would not read into this until we see more of a trend of that. I think he is right though. Like this team, I think that's probably the case for most teams. But this these teams clearly under Randa the last two years are evolving. Like the seat, they get off to. Uh, not a rocky start or a slow start, but they definitely are playing a different brand of football. I think 
at this point. But again, like I said, it's is any eight team weeks not in. like that though. Well, that's what I just said. That's yeah. what I'm reinforcing. Is like I think you could say this about any team right. by the end of the year. Yeah, because it's like that LSU team with Joe Burrow did not look like the LSU team with Joe Burrow at the beginning of the year, and then they just looked like I mean they looked at a whole nother level. Like good teams get better throughout the season. So again, I just I wouldn't read too much into that. Dak, JD90, the push from our O-line and the run game seemed to be much improved this this game. On many plays, Reese wasn't getting touched until well down the field. It was nice to see this. Is this O-line finally becoming more consistent with cohesiveness, or is Khalil Keith low-key the best player we have on offense? Khalil Keith is a monster. And I mentioned this last week against Kansas. He's just a totally different you know mold at that tackle position. Now, saying that, Gavin Byers still got a lot of reps and still played really well. On Saturday. So I think they're all kind of coming together. But yes, when you add a player like Khalil Keith, he helps everyone and helps their entire run game. So yes, he's been a major, major factor. And we kind of all knew he would be. ZT Smith, 423. Who's your favorite young linebacker, at least as far as playing so far on the roster, as far as potential? At least playing as... uh, I mean, my favorite linebacker on the roster is Josh White, but he hasn't played a ton. Um, so I guess if you're asking this guy has to have played, then I guess Tyrone Brown would be my answer to that. Yeah, I mean, I don't even think of anybody off the top of my head, uh, to be perfectly honest. I mean, Tyrone Brown, sure, um, but it is not something that I have given much thought to. I'd have to actually kind of sit down and think about it for yeah, a second. I mean, like Brooks Miller had a good play Brooks in the Miller's game been down good, the sideline. Yeah. He's had a moment. If you're counting Jacks, then Jackie Marshall is on yeah, my list as he well. He's has. looked great. So, yeah, I mean, they, they have a lot of young linebackers, but uh, Josh White, who hasn't played a lot, is one that I'm expecting very big things from in the future. Yeah, it seems like Brooks has had a couple moments here and there. Um, we had like a near interception this last Great game. Pass breakup. Yeah, um, should have been but yeah, a Jackie hit. Marshall's been making some noise. So yeah, they've they've got some guys. Uh, Fort Jen Bear, thank you, ZT. Uh, Fort Jen Bear, how would you rate Tech receivers compared to other groups we've already played or still have to face? Is the fact that our secondary uh, held up in Lubbock a reason to hope or a one off? Um, I think their receivers are probably as good as Kansas State's, but outside of that. The receivers Baylor is about to play are all better. Uh, Oklahoma, TCU, and Texas all have more weapons at wide receiver than Tech does. As far as earlier in the year, they're better than every receiving core except for Oklahoma State and West Virginia. All right. Uh, You said better than everybody? They're they're better than all the other ones except for those two. Because when Baylor played BYU, they didn't have their two best receivers, so... Not counting that, Iowa State's receivers outside of Hutchinson are not very good. Oh, okay, I was um, thinking of, like, you're talking about who they've already played. I was thinking of who they've got upcoming. No, and it, like, yeah, they're yeah. definitely not better than TCU's. No, no, no. Yeah, upcoming, no, no. the only one that they're as good or better than in yeah. is K-State. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, they're they're pretty they're pretty good. They're they're better than they're average. Fine. Yeah, they're, they're fine. Young, they're, yeah. they're, they're very young, and, and that's something that, you know, Joey and them will recruit it up, and they'll find some freaks and, and do it, uh, you know, kind of similar to how we saw here with their own twist on it. Alpha Needle, if Jeff Grimes were to leave after the season for a head coaching offer, is Sean Bell a logical person to replace him as OC, and do you think he's ready for the challenge? Grimes has been mentioned as a potential candidate for the Auburn job because he's been there previously, uh, but what do you think about the question? That's a great question. Um, I, oof, I think you might honestly have, it all depends on what people want, right? Um, what, what do they want to get to at some point? I think I could see a co-OC thing with him and Eric Mateos, um, because those are the two that I'm thinking about as, oh, he could be the OC for this team. Um, so a co-OC would make a whole lot of sense for those two. That would be my goal. If I were Dave Aranda. Yeah, that sounds better than me than I think just outright going one or the other. Um, yeah. I think that that makes the most sense. That's probably the direction I would go. I don't know what their matchmaking is, like how complimentary they are of one another. That would be the thing uh, on whether that could potentially work or not. I'm sure those conversations have taken place or thoughts have taken place because you always got to be ready for – you know, especially as you draw closer, you got to be aware that Grimes is going to be a guy that's going to be mentioned for jobs, and there are going to be others on that staff too. But yeah, I mean, I could I could see that in a dream scenario if like all things were rosy and green and everything. Yeah, Mateos and Bell as co coordinators. But if Jeff Grimes is the head coach, I think he's probably taking Eric Mateos he's with him. Try, yeah, yeah, he's gonna try for sure. Alpha Needle. Uh, also, what do you think Gary Passion is saying to himself right now, considering the success his recruits are having this year at TCU? A, dang, I wish TCU would have given me another year. Look what I would have done. Or B, I blew it. I should have adapted my scheme to take advantage of the talent I had. 
B, but it has nothing to do with scheme. It has everything to do with his attitude, his mindset, his stubbornness, his old fashionedness. Not necessarily his scheme, what he put on the field. I, I just, I, I, he, I think he really botched it in the last year or two. And so TCU made a good hire, it looks like, which is shocking to me because I didn't think it was going to be that great of a hire when they initially made it. Yeah, I mean, I think they're certainly benefiting. They've got a very old group. I mean, they you do. look at all their players, like all their stars are yeah. like junior, senior guys, and that's what Baylor was last year. It's very similar to that in that way. Um, and so I think, you know, let's see, like uh, Sonny's doing a great job, but let's see in like two years when he's playing with like, and I know this is the whole, like see him with his own guys, but uh, I mean, he really did inherit a hell of a group on offense for an offensive minded guy to take over. And Garrett Riley's doing a good job too. He's going to get a job. Yeah. Or, but I mean, yeah. like God, I mean, they're, they're loaded, man. Kendry Miller and Darius Davis and Quentin Johnston and Max Duggan. And yeah, but they didn't ever develop Duggan. When Patterson was there, like, it's no surprise that now it's like, oh, now Duggan's playing good. This is, you know, weird. Also, they yeah. didn't choose him to be the, the guy. But he's weird. like, they didn't just suddenly turn him into a great athlete. Like, they, yeah, they're no, using sure. him well. I'm saying he inherited a great group of, of players, yeah. and he's using them well. Um, Gary botched it. He got too into his own head and his own feelings and his own little emotions and became a grouchy, um, unlikable stressful kind of, I think, uh, uh, problem in that, in that program, uh, to an extent. And that's why, you know, they're, pl they're playing like they just, the world's been lifted off their shoulders this year. Uh, they're playing a lot less stressful and it's showing in, in how they're going about their business. So I think he's learned a lesson if he's ever a coach again of like, I probably need to, to chill out a little bit. Uh, let's see. Osos Del Rio Brazos is a TC or bust this year for Big Twelve and the CFP. Is it wrong? I prefer bust. Yeah, it is TC or bust. Yeah, and it's going to be bust. TC is not making the college football playoff. Yeah, no, I and I don't blame you at all I, for for one of them to to not make it. Uh, I I can see that they certainly wouldn't be rooting for Baylor to make it just for a little bit of extra money that doesn't go in their pockets directly. So yeah, I don't think Baylor fans should have to root for TCU to to be the first non OU team to make the CFP. But yeah, it's basically them or nothing. Well, and Baylor gets to do something about that too. Yep, they have to come here and play. So yeah, TCU got a chance last year, and we saw what they yep. did. They basically kickstarted the whole run, and uh, yep. Joey left that week, and that's when everything looked like it was going to fall apart. And that was actually the start of everything getting to be really good. Overall, Minion, hey guys, on the NIL front, is there a way that Sikkim could share the different ad content that our Bears are a part of? For example, I'd love to see a Reese's ad with Richard Reese at the center of it all. Also, I don't know anything about business, but if y'all had all this NIL content in the site, could y'all pitch it as advertising for these companies and have them pay for it? It could be a win-win because we have a single place to see all of our Bears NIL content and you get paid. Uh, it's slightly more complicated than that. Yeah. Yeah, we can't just, like, grab, like, that's, like, his deal's through Reese's and through probably Open Doors or whatever the deal is. That has nothing to do with us. So us reaching in there and grabbing a piece of the pie, I don't think that they would probably prefer that and... It'd be nice on our end if we could just be like, yeah, let's have a Reese's ad. But right. Reese's would have to want to do that, and that's I'm not a salesperson, so that's all very much out of my my range there. Yeah, and I don't know what everyone's a part of, to be honest. As far as as far as like what all they're Bears, advertising, yeah. like the Baylor athletes, I think is what he's saying. Yeah. but yeah, I mean, there's there's Open Doors, I think right. that has all that, and that's kind of what that's for. But that's not really Sikkim's avenue. So, no. yeah, um, maybe. Maybe that's uh, somewhere there's more crossover I, I down the line, but I don't even know how that would work, to be honest with right. you. Yo, Jake, just ready for OU. Now to questions. Do we get more Jenkins now? I think we just talked about that a little while ago. Yep. It doesn't seem like he's quite ready. How do we attack OU's defense, and what must we do on defense this week that could be different than the last two weeks, which have been very good? Yeah, RVO is how you attack Oklahoma's defense. you got to be able to present a physical running style because that's where they've struggled the most and then hit them with play action. It should be pretty self-explanatory on the offensive side. Like, just do what Baylor's done, and that should be very successful against Oklahoma this week. Uh, defensively, it's going to be a little bit different because Oklahoma's going to challenge them a little bit more in the run game, even more so than Kansas and definitely more so than Tech. So they're probably going to have to put a couple more guys in the box. I think you're going to see more blitz schemes as well out of this Baylor team. Um, but in general, the hope would be that they can stop the run with a four-man front and drop everyone back in coverage. Um, if that does happen, then Oklahoma is in a lot of trouble in this matchup. Bears Dynasty 20, how do you think our defensive backfield is able to handle Oak 
Oklahoma's passing game. They obviously looked much better than the beginning of the season in the last two games. We were successful in holding down Tech's quick, short-range pass game, but how will that success translate to OU, which wants to do largely the same thing, but with more talented receivers and plays designed for bigger gains? Thanks for the excellent Baylor coverage. As always, I'll be in town as part of the alumni band next weekend, so hoping for a win here to make that game huge and exciting. Well, thank you, Bears Dynasty. Yeah, thank you for that. I would say that I don't think the offenses are the same with Tech in, in Oklahoma. I, again, Tech is a legit top 20 rushing football team in the country. Tech does not run the ball. Like, Oklahoma establishes a front, and they want to get the run game going, and then they want their passing game to feed off of the run game. So, uh, to me, this is going to be more about Baylor. Again, Baylor's able to put very few guys in the box because they felt comfortable about stopping the run with their three-man front. Um, so it made things a little bit easier on the secondary. I expect them to be challenged significantly more in this game because there's going to be less guys in coverage to stop Oklahoma because you got to stop the run game first and foremost against Sooners. So appreciate the questions this week and ought to be an interesting matchup. I mean, there is uh, elements of the old offense that you saw in Waco for so many years with uh, Jeff Levy calling the shots in addition to what he learned with uh, – Lane Kiffin there for a little while. And, of course, Josh Heupel, who's now soaring at Tennessee, had some crossover there at UCF. So he's been around arguably like three of the top offensive minds in college football uh, over the last decade plus. Um, But Baylor also beat him and knocked his quarterback out of the game early in the Sugar Bowl back in January. Um, I'm sure Lane had some things to do with that offensive game plan. But still, that was a big Baylor win. That's the last time they saw... Uh, Oklahoma's OC and uh, Venables the last time that Aranda saw him they were opposing defensive coordinators in the national championship game as Aranda's LSU Tigers led by Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson beat Brent Venables Trevor Lawrence led Clemson Tigers so that was the last time these two head coaches faced they were I think two of the highest if not the two highest paid assistants in all of college football back then as D coordinators yeah so, uh, yeah, now they're both head coaches and squaring off in the Big 12. Small world, but uh, should be uh, making for a cool matchup in Norman this weekend. So, I guess uh, there's nothing else let's get into. Well, uh, one real quick, Christian Brathwaite decommitted, uh, committed to LSU. Yeah, um, after a visit. After a visit to the Tigers, speaking of LSU, uh, obviously big linebacker commit that's no longer a uh, part of the class. So, what's it mean and – Kind of where do they go now? Yeah, so he took a visit to LSU for the game against Ole Miss and then informed the staff that he was going to decommit and commit to the Tigers. Uh, LSU was his dream school, so that's kind of what led to all this. He enjoyed his time there and decided that was the better fit for him. Baylor will still recruit him, um, but it's looking like a long shot at this time. And that that's pretty much it, right? Because they still have these spots available. It gives them one more spot of flexibility in the class. Uh, but in general, they don't have like a guy that's a one-for-one replacement for him. You know what I mean? Like they're not sitting there like, okay, we have to get an interior linebacker now. Uh, that's not really the way this is going to go. It's going to be about best available guys, using some of those spots for transfers, uh, looking at JUCOs as well. Um so that's kind of kind of be how they adapt, you know, from losing him. Um, but it's a big loss. He was one of my top five uh, prospects in the class. So um, you know, it's a it's a tough one, especially for a guy that was not only committed for a long time, but was a Baylor lean basically since his freshman year. So uh, a really tough one to see go. Uh, a big recruiting win for LSU, and uh, I know this one hurt uh, the Baylor staff a little bit because. Um, Again, he was a commit for a really long time and a guy they recruited for a really long time. Uh, So not so people will monically go NIL, NIL, NIL. Um, Uh, I mean, maybe, but but I wouldn't know. Um, I would know more as far as the whole, like, he's always loved LSU and was kind of waiting on that offer. I'm just, I know that question's coming or that comment's coming in this era, and it's a fair comment in this era to make. Um, So I'm. probably could have played a little bit but as you said dream school and and it's not really hard to sell LSU is why he'd want to go there playing well yeah absolutely so um that's a bummer um you know that's a hit to the class no doubt but you feel like Ron Roberts and Dave Aranda and company can find some some more linebackers somewhere along the way but certainly a talented one no longer a part of the class so regroup and build off of what they're doing and man they got a brilliant opportunity in front of them starting this weekend going to norman the last time maybe ever 
certainly the last time for some time that they'll be going up to Norman. So that's a big deal. So the team that's better than them, yeah. Yeah, just ask their fans. Uh, they're SEC bound and all that jazz. But uh, it's part of a full slate is now the Big 12 will be all 10 teams in action every weekend from here on out over this final month uh, leading into the championship game in Arlington, which as it stands right now would be a TCU-Kansas State rematch after – the events of this weekend, but Grayson, let's get into uh, what's in store starting on Saturday. All right, let's start at 11 a.m. on Fox. Uh, Texas Tech travels to TCU to take on the Horn Frogs. TCU is a nine and a half point favorite. The over under is 69 and a half. TCU survived in Morgantown. Texas Tech got blown out by Baylor. Which side are you on here? Um, I'm picking TC to win the game, but I don't think that they're going to blow Tech out. I think Tech's going to be really locked in and focused and motivated after this week. I think that they let all the noise get to their heads last week and affect them, and I think they're going to be tunnel vision on on TCU and the challenge that the Frogs present. TCU's got a horseshoe up their backside. Like, There's no doubt about that. Um, so I go Frogs here at home. Um, but I, I don't think they're just going to you know, waltz right past the Red Raiders. I think Joey and Tech are going to give them a bit of a fight. Yeah, and there's a little bit of drama here with the whole ticket sales thing yes. that happened in the uh, offseason. Also, didn't a TCU court or recruiting goes, coordinator tweet something? That oh, was, Brian Carrington, yeah, Mr. Carrington, yeah. from right. Texas days, uh, from the Tom Herman days, the most obnoxious of days uh, not right. that long ago. He was talking trash about Lubbock, right? Yeah, he made a comment. I think it's because... Tech was on a little that recruiting run this off season yeah. when they were you know like we're the number one class in the country and or like they they had picked up somebody I forget the exact sequence of events but Tech was having recruiting success TCU was kind of an afterthought because they had no mojo at that point Brian Carrington popped off and said something about Lubbock and that it sucks on or something a drive through Lubbock he like oh, did a video okay I think, and you could see the the you know dirt okay well I forgot that part of it yeah. but yeah he was basically <laughs> taking shots at Lubbock which they are like supremely insecure about like, they like that's that's worse than cursing their mom is to right. talk bad about Lubbock Texas it's it's wild but they love it and they got fiercely defensive over it and yeah that created some some extra ammunition to this game for so. sure uh tc is gonna win this game yeah. um but tech will keep it close like you said i think this will be high scoring as well but i like tcu 41 to 33 uh they'll get it done and they'll get to nine and oh um which basically will cement them into the big 12 championship um although you know it's still possible you know if they get into a three-way tie or something with two losses it's yeah. still possible that they miss out uh, but they're looking like Pretty much a lock at this point. Uh, next up, FS1, Oklahoma State travels to Kansas. Uh, Oklahoma trying to rebound after getting obliterated by Kansas State. Uh, Kansas, I believe, is coming off of a bye. Uh, Oklahoma State is only a two-point favorite here. The over-under is 65 and a half. Yeah, they're riddled with injuries, and Gundy didn't really provide a whole lot of optimism that they'll be all that cured from those uh, this weekend. I think Jalen Daniels is back practicing, if I saw correctly, yesterday. That doesn't mean he's necessarily going to play. Uh, this is in Lawrence, but I'm going Oklahoma State. I just feel like Gundy said that they didn't practice the typical way they practice and that they – almost like he was trying to protect them from any more injuries, and they're not going to do that again because clearly that was a bad game plan. They got embarrassed. Uh, so I, I would expect a Mike Gundy-led team to have a response to all that. I mean, come on now. Uh, that was an embarrassing effort and showing and the worst loss in his tenure. So I got to believe they're going to go out to Kansas and get themselves a win and bounce back. Yeah, he sat guys out to, like you say, protect them from injury. I think Spencer Sanders is going to play really well in this game. I think Kansas is kind of treading water right now. They're starting to see their ship sink a little bit. Um, I think Oklahoma State covers this with ease. Uh, something like 34-23, uh, the Cowboys get back in the win column. Next up, 2.30 on ESPN+. Plus. West Virginia travels to Ames to take on Iowa State. Uh, this is a battle for who's going to finish last in the Big 12, at least it looks like at this point. Iowa State's a seven-point favorite. The over-under is 50-and-a-half. Yeah, I mean, I... I have no desire to watch this football game. Um, <laughs> Iowa State's incompetent on offense. They have no running game. Hunter Deckers is fine, uh, but has a long way to go. Their defense is great. Their defense is the best unit in this game, and I'll give them the nod because of that. Um, West Virginia can win this game if they play like up to their, their level best, but I think Iowa State kind of squashes what they want to do offensively, and 
I don't know what happens with the Iowa State offense versus the West Virginia defense. Like, that's the huge wild card. I have no idea what happens there. I'll go Iowa State because it's in Ames. And the whole home field thing, doesn't. that's not an exact science at all. But I, I really have no other way to break this game down. So, yeah, Iowa State. Yeah, West Virginia has been terrible on the road. That's the only reason why I would give the edge there. But I would definitely take West Virginia with the points, though. Um, seven points. That seems like a lot for two teams that I don't think are going to score a ton in this game. Um, so I'll take Iowa State, but I think it'll be something like 24 to 21, something along those lines. I think it'll be a very good game. Um, but I don't know. I it. The way Iowa State played last week was really shocking to me. They showed no heart at all against Oklahoma. So we'll see. They don't see. have a run game. Yeah, they don't. They and don't have any run cost game. them. Um, next up, 6 p.m. on FS1, Texas travels to Manhattan uh, to take on everyone's new favorite to win the Big 12, the Kansas State Wildcats, after they demolished Oklahoma State this past weekend. Texas is coming off of a bye, though. Um, Texas is a 2.5-point favorite. The over-under is 54.5. I can't ever peg Texas, man. Like, I, you know, I'm a guy who could probably be classified, as, uh, people would assume as a Texas hater because of the whole Oklahoma thing. But um, I'm, I've, I try to be objective as, as all possible. And I think I give Texas the benefit of the doubt more than anybody. Yeah. And it's not even a whole reverse psychology thing, although it might be a little bit. Um, but I, I really don't know because just when I think that they've gotten over their arrogance and all that, it's like it returns with a vengeance. Uh, just when I think they've they've got a more of a blue collar focus, like it's back to the same old UT type of stuff. Um, I think they're a good team when they're you know just analyzed as a team. But I don't know what kind of outside factors creep into them, and um, and therefore it's just hard for me to peg. Like, is it going to be windy? <laughs> is Quinn Ewers going to have to worry about the wind? Like, I I don't know what what affects them. You know, to to the extent that I can really um, know confidently how they're going to perform in Manhattan, Kansas on Saturday. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so having said all that, I'll go with Kansas State. I do think Texas will play them very close. Um, I don't know that Skylar Howard is going to have another – or Will Howard is going to have another brilliant performance like he had the other day. But uh, Or even if he will play, it might yeah. be Adrian Martinez. I, I Martinez is bad. Yeah, it might be Martinez. So that's a that's certainly a, a little bit of a – of a wild card as well. I'll go K-State. Uh, I'm not super confident in this. I think Texas can play upset here. But, yeah, give me K-State right in the hot hand right now. Yeah, I'm taking Texas in this one. Now, see, um, there you go. See? Yeah, it's just that mindset of, oh, they just blew out Oklahoma State. They've I been know. on this run of playing yep. really good teams week after week. I think Texas gets back in the win column. They're coming off of a bye. I think K-State's going to come into this game with a little bit beaten up. And so I think Texas is going to win this game. Uh, something like 35-30. It'll be a good one, but I, I like the Longhorns to get it done. And then finally on ESPN Plus at 2 p.m., Baylor travels to Norman to take on the Oklahoma Sooners. Oklahoma's a three-and-a-half point favorite. The over-under is now 58-and-a-half. Yeah, why Why were they like four-and-a-half-point favorites yesterday? I, I didn't understand that at all. Like, is that just early money or it something? It dropped to three, and now it's back up to three-and-a-half. So That's the weird. money's going towards Oklahoma. Yeah, um... Okay, I'm going Baylor. Uh, I think, you know, so long as they play the way they played last week, and I don't mean, like, getting five interceptions. I just mean, like, being capable of doing that, but playing just with the attitude that they had and with the game plan with the, that they had. Like, obviously the game plan will be different, but just executing that game plan, whatever that may be. Uh, I like them to rattle Gabriel. I like them to shut down Eric Gray and company. Uh, I like them to, to hit some explosives on offense and run uh, well with Richard Reese. Um, I think Baylor should win this game, um, but they've got to avoid the pitfalls I wrote about and that whole, like, that air of, oh, we just won, we won a couple, of, like, block out all that BS, lock in like you locked in for Lubbock, and go play that game, you'll go beat Oklahoma and Norman and make a big statement. And then if you really want to hear people talking, there'll be people talking if you're winners of three straight and you you know you went back to back in Lubbock and Norman and got wins uh but you got to go and do it first yeah and this is a big one because this would push Baylor to four and two in conference with games against K-State TCU and Texas remaining so a lot on the line here for this Baylor team if they want to repeat as Big 12 champs I like them to win this game I don't think Oklahoma is very good uh and the problem is is Oklahoma defensively just that inability to stop the run makes it impossible for me to pick them 
in this matchup because when Baylor runs the ball well, they're nearly unbeatable um, in my eyes, at least from what we've seen this year. And so, yeah, I, I'm going to take Baylor here. I think they win fairly comfortably, 41-31. Um, I think OU will score some points, but I, I think the Bears are just the better football team. All right, uh, that'll wrap us up for this week. Uh, it was a lot of fun seeing the Bears handle their business in Lubbock, uh, but now it's on to the next challenge and going to Norman, and they better come with the same type of edge that they – had a, a week ago, or it could be another one of those Provo, Morgantown type trips. I mean, they've seen both sides of the coin. They know what's what now. There's no shocker around the corner. Handle your business, and you'll handle your business. Uh, slack off and read headlines, and you'll get embarrassed and be right back in the back of the Big 12 standings real quick. Like So uh, we'll see what team emerges on Saturday. But, uh, yeah, all in on Baylor and Oklahoma. More coverage to come throughout the week on the website, and, of course, on 365 Sports Radio. Anything before we go, Grayson? No, I, just another exciting week, and just to see if the Bears can continue this momentum. It's uh, It's been a up-and-down ride for sure. Hopefully it keeps trending up. Yes, 6-3 uh, and three would be pretty cool, yeah. and it uh, would make for a very interesting last three weeks of the year, but uh, got to go and, and do that first. All right, uh, appreciate uh, Garrett and uh, Jack and uh, – uh, Jacob as well behind the scenes. Appreciate Grayson as well. And uh, for all those folks, I'm Craig Smoke. Check you next time. It's been the Bearcast on 365 Sports, sickum365.com.